name's Simon Moore. Um, I'm bringing you a, a short lecture today. We've only got half an hour, so this won't be particularly in depth. It's on the domino theory, not the domino effect. That's the domino effect kind of features in the domino theory. A, a domino effect features in the domino theory. It's just a slight issue with the printers. So we're talking about the domino theory today. This involves multiple conflicts, um, which uh, fed into the domino theory and resulted from it in part. Nori starts at the end of the Second World War, so I've been involved with the display over in the, in the chapel, looking at a timeline of kit during the Second World War, and as part of that, there is a, a set of kit and equipment of a British soldier of what might have happened if the war with Japan had continued. Of course, there were the dropping of the two atomic bombs, which led to the surrender of Japan. And this meant, of course, that all the areas that Japan had occupied in Southeast Asia, some of which were former Western territories of Western countries, and some of which were part of the Japanese Empire, uh, were occupied by Allied forces in various forms. There are, I say, three conflicts we're going to talk about, but one of them split into two, really. Who's, has anyone here heard of the first Indochina War? Okay, we've got one, two, three, fantastic. Anyone heard of the Malayan Emergency? A few more, okay, good. <coughs> Anyone heard of Korean War? There are a lot more people. And the Vietnam War? <laughs> Everybody's heard of the Vietnam War. Okay, that's, that's good. Um, so, the different countries we're going to be talking about, these conflicts are all essentially, eventually the result of, of the end of the Second World War and the way that that was dealt with. Two of the countries we're talking about, Malaya and Indochina, which will become the, an area of which will become Vietnam, but we're going to talk about Indochina as a whole, and then it's the effects on Vietnam. These have been uh, colonies of France and Britain, respectively. So Vietnam or Indochina have been a French colony, and then Malaya was a British colony. And this, forgive the, uh, the rather rough map here, it's the best I could do with the chalk and, uh, and working on the small map. So at the end of the Second World War, both of these countries, or Indochina, the area of Indochina and Malaya, had been occupied by the Japanese. And much as after the end of the Second World War, it was fairly clear that the colonial era was going to come to an end, because India gained independence in 1948, as did Burma, just up here. Uh, Malaya was reoccupied by the British. We went back in and re-established colonial rule in Malaya. Vietnam would come back under the rule of the French. A slightly different situation in Vietnam. We have the British arriving from the south, so Britain comes in from the south into Saigon. From the north, you have the nationalist Chinese forces of Chiang Kai-shek moving in from the north. So the country is essentially split between these two um, powers coming in to remove the Japanese uh, and, and take, take, the, take over and, and uh, deal with the surrendered Japanese troops in Vietnam. Korea is different, but Korea is obviously part of this story as well with the Korean War. Korea had been part of the Japanese Empire since the beginning of the 20th century, the early 20th century. However, with Japan's defeat, there is no less opportunity here for Korea to become its own nation again. And what happens in Korea is you have the Soviets move in from the north. The Soviets have joined the war against the Japanese after the victory over Germany in Europe. They'd agreed to do so and they were true to their word. And from the south, the Americans come into Korea. So Korea is split into 38th parallel, and both sides start building up governments in their own image to a degree in each half of the country. We're going to go back to Vietnam now, Indochina. As already mentioned, the country is essentially split between the nationalist forces of Chiang Kai-shek and the British in the south. Now, the French want to return. In Vietnam, it's you, you see that basically the strongest sort of nationalist movement grow out of the resistance of the Japanese. In both Malaya and Vietnam and in Korea to a degree, there have been in local resistance movements to the Japanese occupation. You have the Viet Minh in Vietnam, and you have the Paja, the Malayan People's Anti-Japanese Army in Malaya. So by far the stronger of these two was the Viet Minh in Vietnam. And they were actually able to establish, at the end of the war, the Japanese threat, they were able to establish a rule over the country. For about 20 days, they are essentially the de facto civil power. These are both communist fronts, which becomes important as the Cold War begins to ramp up. The Viet Minh essentially have control of Vietnam, or the area of Indochina. Um, Vietnam has not yet been carved out as a country for, from this, but uh, we'll talk about it in those terms. The Viet Minh are not happy about the Chinese coming in. Uh, the Chinese make rumblings that they, they quite like 
occupying this area of territory, they may not leave. And as a way of getting the Chinese nationalist forces to leave, they agree for the French to come back on a temporary basis. So French troops arrive tacitly, there's a tacit agreement to this. The French, or certainly the French colonial authorities, are quite clear that they want to reimpose their rule by force. And that's their intention. The British are behind this as well, you know, the forces we have there assist in doing this. The Viet Minh at this time then decide with their leader Ho Chi Minh they will go to France, try and discuss matters, see how they can take this forward, how they can develop a, a, a national government for Vietnam or for uh, this area of Indochina they want to carve out as Vietnam. And uh, this isn't unreasonable at the time, the Cold War hasn't really ramped up yet. This is all in the very late 1940s, well, the late 1940s, this is pre-1946 in fact, this is still in 1945. And uh, the French actually have communists in the government through 1945 and, and early 46. There's actually communist elements in the French government. So the idea of a communist government in Vietnam being acceptable isn't that outlandish at the time. However, as already mentioned, the actual colonial uh, government, the French colonial forces in Vietnam, uh, they don't uh, see this as a way forward. They have their own ideas about how things are going to go. So the first conflict to break out is in late 1946, the end of 1946, the Viet Minh, getting nowhere with sort of political uh, avenues, decide to take up arms and drive the French out. So the first Indochina War begins in 1946. The situation in Malaya, as I've already mentioned, and Paja were not in the position, the Malayan People's Anti-Japanese Army were not in a position to step forward and take power. The British return. The British have actually assisted the Malayan People's Anti-Japanese Army during the war. The same is true for Viet Minh. The Americans were helping the Viet Minh to fight the Japanese in Vietnam, uh, or in Indochina rather. In Malaya, Empaja uh, march alongside, members of Empaja march alongside the British in the victory parade, very buddy-buddy to start off with. Um, there is an idea that independence will come, even at this early stage, the, the idea that the imposition of British rule is not going to be permanent. I think there's, a fair, there's basically a tacit understanding that this is not going to be the case forever. But there's no set timetable, and this causes problems, and this causes friction. There's the ongoing war in, in Vietnam, or what will become Vietnam, uh, the French are fighting there, and in 1948 in Malaya, the reorganised Malayan People's Anti-Japanese Army, uh, again a communist front, starts to engage in terrorist activities. The focus at this time is the industry in Malaya, tin and rubber being the two major industries in Malaya at this time, very important, generating a large amount of foreign capital for the British Empire at the time. They start to attack plantation owners, they start to attack and break machinery, they attack workers. Uh, so you have a, a guerrilla campaign going on in Vietnam and you have a combined guerrilla and terrorist uh, campaign going on in Malaya. This is 48. So things are looking pretty hot in Southeast Asia, obviously. In Europe, there is an east-west divide. There's obviously the fear of the communists beginning to develop. But even with the Berlin crisis, even with later the uh, crystallization of the satellite countries, the crushing of attempted rebellions in the satellite countries, the dividing line in Europe is essentially drawn. Southeast Asia is where we start to see the threat of countries which aren't communist now becoming communist and communism spreading. And this begins to focus the mind as the Cold War carries on. So the Malayan emergency, as I say, kicks off in 1948. In 1949, absolute bombshell. We've already spoken about the Chinese nationalist forces moving into the north of uh, the Indochina Peninsula there. China in 1949 goes communist. Bombshell. The Americans have been very supportive of China, of the nationalist forces in China, and they are defeated. Mao Zedong takes over, and you have the People's, People's Republic of China uh, set up. So you now have China as a communist. A huge change in the power balance in the world. And at this time, communism is very much viewed as a monolithic bloc. The Soviets and Chinese are viewed as being you know, in bed with one another, as it were. Probably the Soviets on top and in charge. Very cool relationship in actual fact, but this wasn't known at the time, and this would continue, it would grow to be the case that the relationship between China and the Soviets would actually continue to break down. But it was very cool from the start, but it wasn't seen as that at the time. So that's 1949. Um, in 1949, the French in Vietnam, growing somewhat frustrated with the situation, they decided to set up a rival state to Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh obviously staking a claim to run the country. The French decide, well, the best thing to do is to set up a country which is supportive of us, it's on our side. And they set up essentially a puppet state under the former emperor, Bao Dai, who'd actually been the puppet under the Japanese. So an interesting choice. Uh, but he was seen as a fairly legitimate choice by the French, and so they set up the state of Vietnam. And this is where Vietnam as a, as a state begins to crystallise. 
Um, doesn't really help them in their war effort, but this is what they decide to do. 1950, moving to 1950, some fairly serious events take place in 1950. Uh, the Korean War breaks out. So we've, been talked, we've talked already about how Korea was split in two. You have the Americans in the south, and in the north you have the Soviets. And they've essentially groomed someone for power, Kim Il-sung, and he's put in power. And um, in, the, in the south you have uh, Syngman Rhee, who's uh, an American-educated uh, Korean, who is a validly anti-communist and is therefore their choice to, to run the south. The north invades the south with the avowed intention of reuniting the Korean Peninsula as one country under communism. There's a reason for this. The Soviets now support the Koreans in doing this. The, Koreans, the north Koreans have been making noises about doing this for a while. The Soviets now have the atom bomb. That the Americans no longer have a monopoly on atomic weapons, which they had. The Soviets now have the atom bomb. And of course, you now have Red China as well on the border, able to support North Korea. The Korean War, I will run over very briefly here, obviously, with very limited time. From north, there's a move right the way south, a little pocket around Busan gets left. The South Koreans are not able to defend against the northern invasion. The Americans send troops from Japan. These troops are not combat ready. The men who were involved admit freely in interviews carried out for documentaries after the fact they had a very easy time in Japan after the war's occupation forces. They were not combat ready and they were not able to really slow down the advance of the North Koreans. However, the UN goes to war in Korea. This is not just that everyone thinks of the Americans versus the North Koreans, the Chinese, so it's very much a UN conflict. America provides the bulk of the non-Korean, non-South Korean forces but you have lots of countries involved in uh, in Korea. You have obviously the UK, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Belgians, Ethiopians, French, a whole load of Greeks, Turks, you know, everyone sends forces basically. The Indians send a field ambulance. Um, it's a large conflict that breaks out in Korea. It's not a small war. And unlike the wars over here, this is a conventional war. It's not a guerrilla campaign. There are there's a guerrilla element to it behind the lines, but it is primarily a, a, a conventional war. Heavy artillery, armour, you know, a, a conventional war in that regard. So the Korean War uh, rumbles on. Um, the Chinese uh, decide to get involved. Once the UN forces have built up in Korea, there were landings at Incheon behind the North Korean lines. The, having moved all the way south, the, the North Koreans, by the winter of 1950, are pushed all the way back up to the Chinese border. This is a very fast-moving war in the first year. The Chinese get involved and push the UN forces all the way south again. And then eventually you get sort of stabilisation and trench warfare and a stalemate basically breaks out in, uh, in, in Korea. You have a, a stalemate, very much trench warfare. Um, and that essentially means that the war becomes very static at that point. A big drain on lives. The Chinese lose huge numbers of men because they're pitting flesh against Western uh, firepower, Western steel. Uh, China, of course, the, uh, the communist state of China at this point, not recognised and of course rather making themselves known they weren't recognised in the UN, and uh, they were rather making themselves known by being so heavily involved in this war. The Soviets actually sent combat pilots as well. A lot of people don't realise that the Soviets were invo involved in combat in Korea. Just the closest you get to an actual hot war involving the two superpowers in that regard. And the, there is this limited involvement from the Soviets in actual combat. In 1950, the Vietnam War is grinding on. The French also sent troops to Korea, but they're still fighting Vietnam. Uh, in what's becoming more and more of a grinding quagmire war against these, this guerrilla opponent. And the, the conventional elements as well, the Vietnamese, the Viet Minh are actually dominating large parts of the country. In Malaya, the, there is an operation um, called the Briggs Plan, or, or a plan is enacted called the Briggs Plan, to try and separate the population from the terrorists, from the communist terrorists, stop them providing food and so forth. You end up with fortified settlements, which is something the French would do as well. Putting the, native pop putting the local population inside protected villages where they can be kept separate. The strict curfews, it's very real restriction on freedoms in the country in order to try and beat the communist terrorists. It doesn't really endear you to the, the native population in some ways. It was actually driving support for the communist uprising. So not ideal from that point of view. And the whole region looking rather unstable at this point. You have three wars going on all at once in the early 1950s. The situation in all of these countries did not improve in 1951. A good example from Malaya in, Malaya in 1951, the High Commissioner, Sir Henry Gurney, is assassinated by the communist terrorists. So the, 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 uh, the civil leader in, in 
uh, colonial leader in uh, Malaya is assassinated. The communist terrorists managed to kill him. Uh, in Korea, you're really bogging down into a stalemate in 1951, as already mentioned. And the same situation in Vietnam, Vietnam the Vietnamese taking over more and more of the countryside, and uh, particularly in the north of the country, where they have their stronghold against the Japanese, they are basically in control. The French begin to formulate plans of trying to draw them into a, a decisive battle, which we'll get into uh, as we, we carry on. 1952 rolls around, um, change in, in government in the UK. Uh, Winston Churchill comes in for his second term as Prime Minister uh, and appoints Gerald Templer as the new High Commissioner. He's also the senior military commander. He's the, the military commander in Malaya. So the two roles are fused. You essentially have a dictator. And this is the, the medicine that was decided upon to try and fix the problem of communist terrorists in Malaya, the uprising. Uh, he goes for a stick and carrot method, uh, whereby you essentially incentivize good behaviour on the part of the population. We're here are the things the government can do for you. You can bring in education, you can bring in uh, easier citizenship for those who feel dispossessed. A large part of the Chinese population in Malaya didn't have citizenship and couldn't really ever expect to get it. So they felt very disaffected and they made up a bulk of the communist uh, uprising. Try and incentivize them to get on, on board with the government. We will make citizenship easier to get and so forth. And then at the same time, we will have curfews in areas where attacks have taken place. We will have you know, more strict curfews. You will not be allowed out during the hours of darkness. You know, identity cards are introduced and so forth to try and separate uh, and strain out the, the terrorists from the rest of the population. It's in 1953 that things begin to look a little better in one sense. The Korean War grinds to a finale, at least as final as it's ever going to be. There's a ceasefire called, not an armistice, and it's the ceasefire that's still in place today. And a huge amount of blood was shed and a huge amount of money spent to establish the status quo, essentially. You end up still with the two Koreas that we have today, North and South. But the war does come to an end. President Eisenhower, of course, was elected in 1953, and one of his slogans was, I will go to Korea. So his, one of his campaign slogans was, basically, he would sort out the Korean Korean conflict, he would sort out the war and uh, uh, bring it to a conclusion, and the war does conclude in Korea in 1953. It was also in 1953 that the domino theory is first really enunciated, and the domino theory is the idea that one of these countries falling in this area of Southeast Asia, considering China has already gone communist, you would see a precipitous uh, fall of other countries to communism, so the whole of the peninsula here would go, Malaya would go, uh, Korea Obviously, it's a little bit more isolated up here. But nevertheless, the area of Southeast Asia, there would be a domino effect of countries falling to communism if one was allowed to fall. So this sort of focuses the US eyes, who've been very focused on Europe, focuses US eyes on Southeast Asia, uh, and to not allow another Korea to happen. And, uh, or, or, you know, it was a close run, it was seen as being a close run thing in Korea, and that shouldn't be allowed to happen again. And this will influence US policy going forward. In Malaya in 1953, uh, you're beginning to see the effects of the um, uh, you begin to see the effects of the Templars' plan come uh, and bear fruit. So things are starting to improve in 1953 in Malaya. The British tactics, harsh as they are, are working seemingly. It's beginning to improve the situation and the terrorist attack. The country's becoming more stable and it's becoming safer. The same is not true in Vietnam. The Viet Minh are in control of large parts of Viet Vietnam and the North in particular. So the French are beginning to formulate a plan which will come to fruition in 1954. They decide that they will put a large French force into a Viet Minh dominated area. Has anyone heard of Dien Bien Phu? Yes, a couple of people. Dien Bien Phu was up in the north of the country. It was in Viet Minh held territory. And the French had the idea of we will put a, a large body of elite troops, Vietnamese and French, into Dien Bien Phu, into a base camp of Dien Bien Phu, we'll give them artillery support, they will then be able to go on offensive operations against the Viet Minh, but we'll also draw the Viet Minh into uh, battle. If we put them right, it'll be such an irritant, the Viet Minh will have to attack us, and we have such good firepower, it's excellent support from the Americans at this point, the Americans are supporting them with a huge amount of financial aid, materiel, we'll be able to blow them away with superior firepower. It doesn't go down that way, unfortunately. Um, Dien Bien Phu, uh, they build this base, uh, the idea is that it will be resupplied by air, there's an airstrip. They put it on a, a plane, surrounded by hills. There's no um, comprehension of the fact that the Viet Minh will, take the, will undertake a massive logistical effort of bringing heavy artillery up these hills, 
piece by piece, man ported, you know, on the back, carrying parts of the guns, reassembling them, digging them in, camouflaging them, and they will start to shell the base. So they basically put the base under siege, and this takes several months to achieve. They start to shell the base with heavy artillery. The guns are so well camouflaged that the French aircraft and French artillery spotters can't see them. So you can't attack them with ground attack aircraft and you can't undertake counter battery fire against them. So the French are just being shelled. They're taking casualties from shelling. The airstrip is put out of use. They are reduced to uh, aerial uh, airborne resupply by parachute, including men dropping in by parachute as well. And progressively, the base is weakened, the outer line fire bases with their artillery positions are weakened, overrun, and eventually the entire base is overrun by the Viet Minh. They take huge casualties in the process, but they win the battle, and they do what they wanted to do, which is to inflict a serious defeat on the French. So, uh, in 1954, the French basically have to come to the negotiating table and to try and find a peaceful settlement to this state. The morale of the French army is low, the morale of the French people is low. So this is a, not a good situation for the French. As part of this, the Americans step up and start to give more aid. They step up to have, take a more direct role in the negotiations and so forth. In 1954, they sponsor the formation of CETO. Now NATO is obviously on everyone's mind at the moment. NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, CETO is formed as the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization with essentially the same aim in mind of providing a, a mutual defense treaty against uh, communist expansion in Southeast Asia. It doesn't work very well. There's far too much bickering. There's far too much arguing. It doesn't work in the way NATO does, but that was the intention. You, you have, uh, as a result of the French um, situation in Vietnam, you have talks in Geneva about how what the future of Vietnam is. And Vietnam, like Korea, is split in two. So you have a north and south. South is a state of Vietnam, and originally still under Bao Dai. He's deposed about a year later by a chap called No Dien Zian, who is the American-backed uh, um, leader, who would go on for, for many years after this. Uh, and then you, you basically have a promise of elections for the whole nation in 1956. These are boycotted by the South, because they believe the communists will win, for two reasons. One, uh, they think there will be ballot management, they think there will be intimidation at the ballot box by communist agitators because they're rife in the countryside. And also, to be honest, Ho Chi Minh was very popular in Vietnam, so it's likely he would possibly have won the vote anyway and he would have had a communist, uh, you know, a one communist Vietnam due to that as well. The Americans support South Vietnam in boycotting these elections, they never take place. So, for the rest of this period, through into the 1960s, Vietnam remains two separate countries, North and South. The situation in Malaya is um, somewhat better. Uh, through into the middle 1950s, you actually have a situation where the country is becoming stable enough due to the, the uh, tactics being used and the success of the campaign to separate the uh, population from the communist terrorists and to win them over to the government side. The country is stable enough to consider independence again. And uh, the Tunku, uh, Tunku is a, a royal title in Malaya, Tunku Abdul Rahman is installed as the first minister in 1955 to shepherd the country towards independence. And in 1957, independence comes and Tunku becomes the first prime minister of Malaya, the Federation of Malaya. At this time, there's actually talks, or they, they enter into talks with the, uh, the communists to see if there's any common ground to be found. It's made clear at this point there's no common ground to be found. The communists actually carry on fighting even after independence. They wanted independence on their terms, of course. They wanted a communist Malaya. So through until 1960, you have the, the British Empire the troops, the uh, British Commonwealth troops, the uh, uh, Fijians, Rhodesians, Australians, New Zealanders, all fighting in Malaya alongside British troops, as long as the, along with the Malays themselves, um, fighting uh, to uh, basically pull the fangs of the, the communist terrorists. And by 1960, this has essentially been achieved. They're no longer an existential threat to the country. Uh, they don't actually stop fighting entirely at this point, but it's no longer really a threat to Malaysia, uh, to Malaya, uh, in terms of uh, stability. And uh, obviously, with the formation of Malaysia going forward, the support of the British Commonwealth will continue through that period. And there's actually further wars in the jungles in the 1960s as part of this, but that's separate to the uh, to the domino theory and, and what we're looking at here. So Malaya and Korea, we can basically draw a line under in this regard. There is further back and forth in Korea, it's spats on the border and so forth, but 
that's beyond the scope of this lecture. The situation in Vietnam, obviously, is very, very different. Um, Ngo Dinh Diem goes on to lead through uh, into the early 1960s. Unfortunately, he becomes increasingly um, authoritarian, uh, religiously intolerant towards the majority of Buddhist population. He himself was Catholic, uh, and uh, he was quite religiously intolerant towards the Buddhists and persecuted them. So there is uh, a great deal of unrest in the country as the 1960s uh, move on. And in 1963, he was uh, deposed in a coup. He was actually murdered after he was deposed, he and his brother. He had gathered his family around him, his brother around the secret police. So you, you had this sort of ruling family, very unpopular. And the US tacitly support this coup. Unfortunately, the coup leads to a series of coups. It destabilizes the country entirely. The country was already rather unstable because you still had communist agitation in the countryside. You had what were now termed the Viet Cong, which was the Viet Cong, Vietnamese communists. It was uh, the sort of the Viet Minh reimagined in a way, in some instances, and in some of it was new Viet, Viet, uh, uh, Vietnamese who'd been um, agitated to fight on the side of the communists. And uh, this then leads to the US working under the domino theory comes full circle, they send in combat troops in 1965 and the Vietnam War, the American Vietnam War flares up and that really brings us to sort of the full circle of the domino theory, how it developed and then it, how it's affected US foreign policy in sending troops into Vietnam in 1965. Not only Americans of course, but you have Australians, New Zealanders, um, Thai forces, you have uh, Koreans, South Koreans go to fight in Vietnam against the communist threat in Vietnam and uh, men from Thailand as well. So uh, that brings the lecture to a close. By way of interest, we have two mannequins here, which we'll have to have a look at the kit of these at the end if you'd like to. Uh, US infantry early on in Vietnam in 1965, a member of the 173rd Airborne Brigade on deployment to Vietnam in 1965. And then you have a mannequin here representing a British serviceman in Malaya in the mid-1950s. Um, and if we take a look at those.